Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And blessed be God's kingdom, now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Father in heaven, who at the baptism of Jesus in the river Jordan proclaimed him your beloved Son and anointed him with the Holy Spirit, grant that all who are baptized into his name may keep the covenant they have made and boldly confess him as Lord and Savior who with you and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns, one God in glory everlasting. Amen. A reading from the book of Genesis. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was a formless void, and darkness covered the face of the deep, while a wind from God swept over the face of the waters. Then God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning, the first day. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Today's psalm is Psalm 29. Let us say this together. Ascribe to the Lord, you gods. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. The voice of the Lord is upon the waters. The God of glory thunders. The Lord is upon the mighty waters. The voice of the Lord is a powerful voice. The voice of the Lord is a voice of splendor. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedar trees. The Lord breaks the cedars of Lebanon. He makes Lebanon skip like a calf and Mount Hermon like a young wild ox. The voice of the Lord splits the flames of fire. The voice of the Lord shakes the wilderness. The Lord shakes the wilderness of Kadesh. The voice of the Lord makes the oak trees writhe and strips the forest bare. And in the temple of the Lord, all are crying, glory. 
The Lord sits enthroned above the flood. The Lord sits enthroned as king forevermore. The Lord shall give strength to his people. The Lord shall give his people the blessing of peace. Good morning. A reading from the Acts of the Apostles. While in Apollos, or while Apollos was in Corinth, Paul passed through the interior regions and came to Ephesus, where he found some disciples. He said to them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you became believers? They replied, No, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. Then he said, Into what were you baptized? They answered, into John's baptism. Paul said, John's baptism was the baptism of repentance, telling the people to believe in the one who was to come after him, that is, in Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized in the, in the name of the Lord Jesus. When Paul laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them, and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. Altogether, there were about 12 of them. The word of the Lord. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Mark. John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And people from the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him and were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair, with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. He proclaimed, the one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the Spirit descending like a dove on him. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, the Beloved. With you I am well pleased. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise you. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be always acceptable in thy sight. O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Good morning. morning. It's my pleasure to be with you once again this first Sunday after Epiphany. And what a wonderful and timely gospel this week brings. Today we concentrate on the gospel of Mark 
and the story of Jesus' baptism in the Jordan River by his cousin John. Now John's what you might call a radical of his time. He was considered strange by some, having wandered around in the wilderness for quite some time. He doesn't look like the traditional Jewish man, instead wearing clothes made of scratchy camel hair and preferring to eat locusts and honey in the woods. Now it must be said that John knows that by dressing this way, he will be compared to the Elijah prophet, the prophet Elijah. And he does this pur purposefully. And because he's so aware of the teachings of the prophets before him, John knows Jesus to be the one who has been named from the beginning, the Messiah, and the one chosen by God. He knows that while he has been baptizing people in the Jordan River for the repentance and forgiveness of sins, he himself is not the chosen one, and he publicly concedes that he's unworthy to tie the lace on the sandal of the one that is to come. This, of course, is Jesus. Now Jesus has heard of the baptisms that John has been performing, and he visits his cousin at the Jordan River. He joins the gray masses of people on the bank of the river and waits with them for his turn to go into the waters to be baptized, which John does. As Jesus was coming up out of the water, the heavens are torn apart, and the Spirit descends like a dove on him, and he hears a voice that came from heaven saying, you are my son, the beloved. With you I am well pleased. Wow, what an epiphany. Jesus has been proclaimed as the chosen one by God himself. And I have so many nagging questions about this story at this point. I want to know why. What, what had Jesus done to make God so proud of him and... Am I worthy of that pride too? Can I do the thing that Jesus did so that God will be pleased with me? Did John invent baptism at this point? Or was it part of Jewish tradition and practice before this? And finally, if Jesus is without sin, and if John's baptism signifies repentance, then... Why did Jesus want to get baptized? Why did he go to the banks of the Jordan only to stand in line with them, to stand with us as sinners waiting to be baptized? In Hebrew, the word mikvah is used in a number of ways. First, it describes the immersion pool built for the purpose of ritual washing or baptism. Jewish law at that time had been passed down orally from generation to generation, and it had several things to say about the need for ritual washing, as well as the most desirable places to do it. There were six different options available that satisfied the requirements of ritual washing, and it started with pits or cisterns of standing water as acceptable, but least desirable, moving up to pits that are refreshed by rainwater as slightly more desirable, then very fine custom-built ritual baths, somewhat like swimming pools, then fountains, and then flowing waters. Living waters, as found in natural lakes and rivers, were considered to be the best possible situation. So seeing John immersing people in the living waters of the River Jordan was perfectly within Jewish law and practice at the time. The practice of ritual bathing in the Bible goes as far back as Exodus, when the Lord spoke to Moses, instructing him to make a laver of bronze for washing before going into the tabernacle. Priests also had to be ritually clean in order to serve at the tabernacle. And Israelites who had become ritually unclean had to restore their situation, both with the passing of time and bathing their whole body in fresh, ritually clean water according to Leviticus. Later, when the temple had been built, it was necessary for everyone to be immersed in a mikvah to become ritually clean before entering the temple. 
There are many of these ancient pools that can still be seen in Jerusalem today. And it's clear to see two sets of steps for each one, a set of steps going down into the mikvah in an impure state, and another set on the other side where you are to emerge fresh and ritually clean. And even the origin of the Hebrew word mikvah can help us understand a bit more about the Jewish notion of immersion. Often the Hebrew language reveals keys in the thought behind these words. And mikvah shares the same roots as Hebrew words for hope and alignment and the concept of hoping or waiting on God. It also, according to Strong's lexicon, means something to be waited for, a collection of water or of men or of horses, an abiding, a gathering together, a hope. The message that baptism signifies of a binding or twisting together gives us good, a good mental picture of what it means to repent our sins and align ourselves with God. Through repentance, we have the opportunity to shed our sins and gather our words, actions, and deeds so that we can be bound to his word and to him. But what of Jesus? Why was he there that day, and what does this mean for us? Jesus could have been doing anything that day, but he chose to go to the river and wait with sinners. Not only did he wait with them, but he entered the river with them with the full weight of their sins on his back, and he was baptized. And when he emerged from beneath the water, God chose that very moment to tell him, like the loving father that he is, that he was proud of him. Why didn't God do that while Jesus was preaching in the temple? Why didn't he wait until Jesus had done something miraculous, like healing the leper or turning water into wine? God chose that moment to call him his beloved son, with whom he was well pleased. And God does that with us, too. If the truth were be told, I think that every one of us is born with a longing to hear those same words. With you, I am well pleased. And it's funny because it's easy to get discouraged in our quest to live a life, that kind of life, when we see Jesus or even friends or family members as the standard for impossible perfection. Jesus was sinless, and yet he is literally at the lowest place on earth with people who are at the lowest point in their lives. You have all these people from all these places coming into the waters as they confess their sins and John's baptizing them. They're declaring everything that is wrong with them and naming all of our sin, all of their sins. And Jesus stands there among them, undistinguished. Why? Because baptism is the one thing that connects Christmas and the cross. At Christmas, Jesus was revealed to us as the Word made flesh, the one who dwells among us. He's like us in all things except sin. But now at the Jordan, he loaded the burden of mankind's guilt and everything that is the worst in humanity upon his shoulders. And he carried it down into the depths of the Jordan. And this is the way he began his public ministry, to be counted among the sinners in baptism. This is where it all began. The moment that Jesus assumes responsibility for our sins and begins the road to the cross. Because baptism is an acceptance of death. That's one of the image of baptism, although we don't often think about that. In order to begin our life as a Christian, we must literally drown and be reborn into new life. Jesus' baptism was an acceptance of God's plan for him, and at the same time, he identified himself with everything that is most broken in our heart. And that is the moment that the Father chooses to declare, you are my son, with you I am well pleased. 
So I don't know about you, but I feel hope in this because, quite frankly, I've been thinking a lot about low places this week, and I welcome any hint of hope that I can find. The events that occurred in Washington, D.C. on Wednesday were painful proof that while, as Christians, we are indissolubly bound to each other through baptism in Christ, we have a long way to go before we can say that this belief makes its way into our daily lives and actions. And if I were to venture a guess, God is not well pleased. In his remarks following Wednesday's events, Bishop Sutton reminded us that Christ's body cannot be found in angry mobs seeking to thwart our democratic processes. We the people who hold the core value of justice for all sacred in both personal and political contexts must acknowledge the fact that since its founding our country has not served justice for all but justice only for some. And while we are tempted to keep saying that the actions of those breaching the Capitol on Wednesday are not who we are, we must acknowledge that while we as a broad category, this is in fact who some of us are. Bishop Sutton reminded us that we, the baptized, have vowed to respect the dignity of all humans, seeking the Christ within them. We, the baptized, carry the special responsibility of being the light of Christ on earth. And there can be no confusing the symbols of light with the symbols of darkness. The politically motivated darkness perpetrated on our country, on the Feast of the Epiphany no less, must never be confused with anything to do with the ministry and commission of Jesus Christ to all who are baptized. Jesus didn't stand on the banks of the Jordan sinless, watching what was unfolding before him, and neither can we. Watching just doesn't cut it anymore. Once again, as baptized Christians, we are called into that low place to do the hard work of acting as Jesus Christ in the world around us by recognizing and speaking out against racism, white privilege, and just plain selfishness. If we are to fully live out our indissoluble, indissoluble baptism, baptismal bonds through mikvah, we will seek ways to repent and begin again with hope and alignment with God's will for the whole world, which was created with care, patience, and purpose. As we reflect on recent events, it's a good time to remember this. That as followers of Christ, we need to also create with care, patience, and purpose. That the world around us is hurting. That hatred and sin are pervasively destructive and unrelenting. But most especially, that God's love is even more pervasive, even more relentless. That Jesus has a history of meeting us at our lowest places. That God is well pleased when we go to him in our darkest moments with repentance. And that it is possible for us to be reborn in him right now by aligning our Christian selves with care, patience, and purpose and serving as Christ's body in the world. Amen. Now let us affirm our faith in our Lord and his church in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God. 
eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. In peace we pray to you, Lord God. For all people in their daily life and work. For this community, the nation, and the world. For the just and proper use of your creation. For all who are in danger, sorrow, or any kind of trouble. For the peace and unity of the Church of God. For Michael, our presiding bishop, and Eugene and Robert, our bishops, and for all bishops and other ministers. For all the God in the church. For the special needs and concerns of this gathering. We pray for those who have been adversely affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. Hear us, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for all the blessings of this life. We pray in thanksgiving for all those who are putting their lives at risk to care for the sick and provide essential services during the pandemic. We will exalt you, our God and King. We pray for all who have died, that they may have a place in your eternal kingdom. We pray especially for the soul of Mary, Reverend uh, Marian Babness, who died this week. Lord, let your loving kindness be upon them. Now let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Have mercy upon us, most merciful God. In your compassion, forgive us our sins, known and unknown, things done and left undone. And so uphold us by your Spirit, that we may live and serve you in newness of life, to the honor and glory of your name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And all Offer one another a sign of Christ's peace.
The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, because in the mystery of the word made flesh, you have caused a new light to shine in our hearts, to give the knowledge of your glory in the face of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. and gracious Father, in your infinite love you made us for yourself. And when we had fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, you in your mercy sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. He stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself in obedience to your will, a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ, Christ has died. Dead. Christ, Christ is, risen. is risen. Christ, Christ will, will come again. again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Recalling his death, resurrection, and ascension, we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in him. Sanctify us also, that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace. And at the last day, bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Amen. 
And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Alleluia, Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Alleluia. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you, and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. Let us pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart, Christ our Lord. Amen. The peace of God which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you always. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated for just a few announcements. First of all, thank you, Deacon Laura, for uh, your sermon this morning, for addressing an important liturgical feast, but also an important time in the life of our country. Uh, I told Deacon Laura that um, whenever there seems to be any kind of national upheaval, it's always the first week of the month, so she gets to preach about it on the following Sunday. So 
I'm going to pray that, you know, if there's any more National Law People, it keeps happening on the first week of each month so that she can <laughs> preach it and I don't have to worry about it. So thank you. Uh, she said what needed to be said, I think. So I also said a few words about it in my reflection for the weekly, and um, we've included our bishop's statement as well in that weekly. So I refer you to those um, for more reflection on this week in the life of our country and also uh, for a prayer that has to do with that. So that's in your weekly from this past week. Um, another thank you. We received um, a thank you from Mary Davison, who works with the Seafarers Ministry in Baltimore. Uh, I was on a clergy, uh, online clergy conference, and she was there and thanked everyone who gave gifts to the Seafarers Ministry, which Carolyn Steiner uh, organized here. So thank you, Carolyn. She said this was a difficult year for them, as it was for everybody, of course, because part of their ministry is really connecting with the seafarers who are kind of isolated when they come here, but obviously they couldn't do that as usual. So she said to have some tangible things to give them helped not only practically, but also just to, as a way to start some conversations. So she was appreciative for that. So thanks for everyone who contributed to the seafarers' gifts and ministry this year. Uh, our next food drop will be on January 26th, January 26th. Note that's later in the month than usual. So that's January 26th, noon, um, here at the parish hall. Show up with your vehicle and help us bring some food to needy families in our area. Contact Mark Basola to register for that. Um, the walk to Bethlehem is continuing on our own at this point. Dale Yo tells me we no longer need to send in our miles to her. We're almost all the way there, uh, so uh, just continue on your own and do the last little bit and keep getting outside and staying active as much as you can at this time. Very important to keep our immune systems up, right? We have a few birthdays this week coming up. Uh, Riley O'Brien, Henry Miser, and Mike Schisler have birthdays this week. I'm sorry if I've forgotten your name and you do have a birthday, but we'll pray for you as well. So let us pray. O oh God, our times are in your hand. Look with favor, we pray, on your servants as they begin another year. Grant that they may grow in wisdom and grace and strengthen their trust in your goodness all the days of their life. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Thank you. Am I forgetting anything else? What's that? Yes, thank you. Uh, we need to say the prayer for spiritual communion, which I didn't do because I have a different book up here. So let's pray that together, and then uh, we'll sing our closing hymn. The prayer for spiritual communion. In union, O Lord, with your faithful people at every altar of your church, where the Holy Eucharist is now being celebrated, I desire to offer to you praise and thanksgiving. I remember your death, Lord Christ. I proclaim your resurrection. I await your coming in glory. And since I cannot receive you today in the sacrament of your body and blood, I beseech you to come spiritually into my heart. Cleanse and strengthen me with your grace, Lord Jesus, and let me never be separated from you. May I live in you and you in me, in this life and in the life to come. Amen. Now please uh, join us from home for our closing hymn.
Thanks be to God. Alleluia. Alleluia. Alleluia.